If we remember that the church is heaven on earth, that helps us keep focused and reminding why the architecture means what it means, why we see what we see, and then as we discussed all summer long with the Divine Liturgy series, why we do what we do. So today we're gonna to focus on what we see. And if we remember that the dome, and so I have my assistant cameraman here, go point all the way up into the dome. If we remember that the dome represents heaven, okay? And so the, in the dome we see an icon that I have to explain to you is not actually proper, but it is there, it is part of our history. In the dome, because the dome symbolizes heaven, is supposed to be Christ as the Almighty God. We call it the Pandocrator, the Almighty, All-Ruling God. Unfortunately, over, over the years of church history, because of influence from the West, some things that are not orthodox proper have filtered into our traditions as well. And one of them is the icon that we have in our particular dome. You see an icon of what is supposed to be depicting God the Father, and it shouldn't be there. Because in orthodoxy, we do not depict God the Father because we've never seen him. Now, the icon is only partially incorrect because if you look at the icon, you see that it's attempting to show that God the Father as the or originator of all things. So what it's trying to teach is truth. But because we've never seen God the Father, in our tradition of orthodoxy, it really shouldn't be there. Now it's been there for many decades, it's part of our local understanding that it's there, but it shouldn't be there, but at least we understand now what it's supposed to be representing. It's supposed to be re representing God looking down from heaven. Okay, so it's not that it's really, really, really bad, although it's not the most correct thing that we would have in our church. And he's surrounded by his angels. Right below the icon of God is the prophets. Now the church, in a beautiful way, in when we depict with holy icons, also shows us the history of the church. So first there was God with his angels, and then he created the prophets, and then he gave us the prophets. And it's actually a historical presentation of mankind's relationship with God. It's the Old Testament. God the creator, then the prophets, and then right below the prophets, you see in our particular church, you see scenes from the life of Christ because the Gospels, the life of Christ, and they're held up by the four evangelists. You see the big four evangelists here on the triangles. So the Gospel stories of Christ and Christ's ministry on earth is what bridges together the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so you have God, then you have the angels, the prophets, and then the New Testament. And then what would you think historically you would see below the New Testament scenes? Take a guess. What would you see? Right, so they're holding up that. So after the Gospels, so look at the four Gospel writers and the scenes of Christ as one section. That's the New Testament. Then come below, what, else, what would you expect to see after the New Testament? We're following the history now. Think, we have God, then prophets, then New Testament. What happens next? The saints. And so after the gospel, what do you have? You have the saints of the church. You have the saints that have, now of course you have also the apostles. So there's the overlap of the New Testament saints and the saints that came after the New Testament. 
okay? And you have at our level, the level of the people, remember Father Samson mentioned that this is the ark of Naos, the ship. At our level, who do you see with us? But our peers, all the saints of the church. And so when we come together in worship, we are coming together what we say in the, the Orthodox language, we have the church militant and the church triumphant. We are the church militant. We're the ones still in the battle. The icons of the saints are the saints that are victorious. They're the ones who are triumphant. They have won the battle. They are with God in heaven. But they don't hold just a casual purpose for being on the walls of the church. They also serve to inspire us. Because if we are struggling with insert struggle here, there are saints who have struggled with it as well. And so, especially when I'm talking to children, I like to say that we put icons on the walls of the saints, kind of like bleachers at a sporting event. The saints are there in the walls to cheer us on. Don't worry, you can do it. You can win, you can be victorious. And so when we look at the saints, we are inspired to keep struggling, okay? Now, behind me is a whole other section of the church. Father Samson talked about the Holy of Holies. He talked about the altar. He talked about the sacrificial altar of the Jewish temple. Behind that marble wall is the Holy of Holies. This is where God dwells 24 hours a day. And so you see, I'm going to step out of the way of the camera a little bit. So you see, of course, Christ in the middle. Now, in our particular church, we have an icon there of Christ as the high priest. It's one of the many traditions there to have to cover the royal gates. But in many churches, it is a, it is a curtain. It is a simple curtain. And that reminds us of the curtain of the temple. When we remember in the gospel when Christ died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain that was being referenced there was the curtain leading into the Holy of Holies. And so now the Holy of Holies opens for us so we can receive the body and blood of Christ, so we can worship God and we can receive his blessings. So that icon is fairly typical but not mandatory. In many cases, there can be just a beautiful curtain there with a cross or just some churches. Uh, if you remember, Holy Trinity, before it had its fire, had brass gates in their royal gates. So there's a variety of traditions there to remind, to remind uh, everyone of that particular element, but it's the entrance into the Holy of Holies. What is standard? in every church throughout the whole world. To your right of the royal gates will always be an icon of Jesus Christ in every Orthodox church throughout the entire world. And on his right hand across the gates will always be an icon of the Panagia, his mother. And on his left hand, in every church throughout the world will always be an icon of John the Baptist. This is referred to as the holy dais. You see it again here up on the wall. You see Christ, the Panagia, and you see John the Baptist, and we've added in that particular icon St. Nicholas and St. Dionysius. But that holy dais, John the Baptist on his left hand and the Panagia on his right hand. John the Baptist is the final prophet of the Old Testament and the Panagia, the holiest of, of the saints of the New Testament. And we remember in Scripture, 
where they say, Christ, we want, when we get into heaven, we want to sit one at your left hand and one at your left, uh, right hand and left hand. And he says, you don't even know what you're asking. He says, those places have already been appointed. And that is John the Baptist and Panagia. Then to your left of the icon of the Virgin Mary is always the name of the church. So, because this is St. Nicholas Cathedral, it's an icon of St. Nicholas. If this were Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Cathedral, there'd be an icon of the Transfiguration in that location. It's always the name of the church. And then, depending on how large the church is, the church is free to add whatever other saints it wishes on the icon screen. Our case, we have Saints Peter and Paul at the lowest level, and we have the apostles surrounding the apse. But you see, if you look visually and you follow the icons around, all the icons are at the same level with the Econestation, with the icon screen. They're all the community of the saints. And as we know from the scriptures, we are surrounded by the saints. We are surrounded by their cloud of witness. One final icon, and then I'll take some questions that I want to mention, is the icon of the Panagia above the altar table. Now, you may have to move around the chandelier to get that one in the camera. I don't know. The dome is heaven, and the floor is earth. The apse joins heaven to earth. And so the icon that the church places in the apse, the icon of the Panagia, we call that particular icon in Greek, platitera ton uranon, which means more spacious than the heavens because the Panagia contained in herself the uncontainable. So one of the names that we refer to her is the greater than the heavens, more spacious than the heavens. We know that from the hymn. And Christ as God comes from heaven through the Panagia to the earth. And that's why our tradition has her in that location, architecturally bridging the heaven and the earth with the apse. Okay. It also happens to be, it also happens to be a very convenient sound assistance. Because in the ancient world, we didn't have microphones and things like that. And so the church also incorporated natural necessities. So in a, in a beautiful uh, acoustical way, the icon of the Panagia, the apse itself, also serves to project the prayers out into the people. But notice that Christ is not sitting on her lap. He's actually enthroned on her heart. And her arms are open, and she's inviting us to also enthrone God on our hearts. Okay? So you have that beautiful, again, the reminder of God coming from heaven through the Panagia down and dwelling on earth with us for 33 years so that we could receive Holy Communion, so that we could live physically united to God. Okay, and that doesn't even begin to discuss all the different saints that we have chosen to depict in our church. Saints that we know, for example, St. Erasmus of, of Kalinos, you have St. Uh, 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 Nectarios, you have all of the saints that are important to our community. And, the, and as, as a family, because we are a family, we want to be reminded of our family members. You know, so you could say that the walls of the church are also a photo album of our spiritual family, the saints and us working together, loving God, struggling, and eventually winning the victory. All right, so that's just a drop in the bucket, but I hope at least a, a slight 
more understanding than what we had before about the interior of our church. I have to tell you one story that is a beautiful reminder of the benefit of icons. Years ago, when I was in Denver, Colorado, they had finished the interior of the church, hundreds of icons inside their church, and one of the icons happened to be the three children in the furnace that we hear about on Holy, Fr on Holy Saturday morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're there in all their fiery glory, and the icon must be 30 feet wide. It's a massive, massive icon. How many of you are familiar with Veggie Tales? If you have children or little grandchildren, you know about Veggie Tales. Veggie Tales did the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in one of their cartoons. Their names were Rack, Shack, and Benny. One day, a little girl comes into the cathedral. She's sitting with her dad. She says, hey, Daddy, look, it's Rack, Shack, and Benny. <laughs> How perfect. No one had to explain what she was looking at. She recognized it right away. Raise your hand if you can read. If you can read, raise your hand. Read, like reading and writing. Raise your hand if you can read and write. It doesn't matter what language, as long as you can read and write. The truth is that for most of human history, most of you would not have been able to raise your hands. Most people could not read. And so the church had the ability to teach the truth of God and to inspire us to live with God using holy icons. We cannot ignore that God knows what we need. We are, psychologists like to say, sensory beings. We have five senses. So the interior and the holy icons is how we worship God and focus on God using our sense of sight. Okay? Any, any questions lingering? Yes. Yes, there's one missing. <laughs> Your homework is to get binoculars and to read the names on those icons. And then you'll know who's missing. Yes. Well, that's a good question. And, and we'll leave it there because it is ten tail. I want to make sure we have enough time for, for, um, for second liturgy to begin. So that's a great question. The difference between church and cathedral. It is an administrative title of honor. A cathedral is simply the headquarter church of an area. And it would have, it normally means that this is the bishop's church. A, a regular church, that's a really weird thing to say, but a non-cathedral, a church, is associated probably with, a, like you know, the church in Newport Ritchie, the church in Palm Harbor, the church in Tampa. All of those churches, and we are the mother church of Tampa Bay, and so we are the, we are the bishop's, um, I don't want to say headquarters because his, his main cathedral is in Atlanta, but we're the, the mother church of Tampa Bay, so we are the cathedral of this area. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distinction based on the administration of the church. That's a great question that goes along with, you know, architecture and things like that, that actually the very word cathedral is because we have a relationship that our, our bishop uses this as his home base in the area. Yeah, so again, uh, uh, w w there's so many freedoms of what icons you can put where. Most cases that I have seen, the icons on the pulpit are the evangelists. In this case, they are not. So it depends on, again, what a community wants to put. It's about what, what our, our closeness is with various, with, with, with various saints. Okay, so we're out of time. 
Remember to let us know your questions. Next week, we're starting a new series for our adult catechism. We are going to go through the 12 great feasts of the church. So every week, we're going to learn about one of the great feasts, either of Panagia or of Christ. So next week, we're starting with the Nativity of the Panagia, which we just celebrated uh, last week. All right, God bless you.